I will introduce Chris Seifer briefly uh, because we go way back uh, and Chris Seifer was our, to begin with, our top investigator of the most sophisticated frauds in the western third of the nation and we worked together for many years. Uh, and since that wasn't enough to keep him busy, even though we were literally working 14 hours a day for six years, uh, he put himself through at night uh, first an MBA program and then a law program. Um, so he, he actually knows things. And I will uh, warn you in advance, if it ever is relevant, he can read upside down which is a really useful talent for an examiner when the CEO is reading off a script that says, don't sit, talk about this. <laughs> and he has now uh, both been the, the investigative head of Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and a distinguished partner at one of the firms that specializes in going after these folks. Thank you. And partner. And I, <laughs> he's one of the partners not in jail. <laughs> which <laughs> in, the, in the plane of sphere has been an important goal recently. Several of my former partners, actually no longer in jail, but <laughs> ran afoul of some laws. Um, so let me, I'm going to take somewhat of a different tact. You know, when I was uh, a bank examiner or a fraud investigator working at DOTS, or when I was at the FCIC, I could look at any documents I wanted. And it's very easy, in my opinion, to figure out and document the fraud if you have unfettered access to the documents. At the FCIC, we had subpoena authority. At the OTS, I had my badge that said, give me any, whatever documents I want to see. Back in the SNL crisis, there were big loans that you would look at. Of course, Lincoln Savings is the main institution that we think about back then. They were doing these huge multi-million dollar construction loans, acquisition development and construction loans that were huge. So you just ask for the loan file. And, and let me give you a couple of examples of what was going on there. Uh, there was a limited partnership where the limited partners were Charlie Keating and his other senior executive officers. They bought a hotel in Detroit called the Hotel Pontchartrain. They had Lincoln Savings finance that acquisition. And let's assume the appraisal was legitimate. That loan itself was a 100% loan, right? But they needed money to run the operations of the hotel. So after that loan was made, they make a $20 million unsecured loan to that partnership. So Charlie Keating and his officers that run Lincoln Savings cause Lincoln Savings to make the partnership a $20 million loan that, frankly, is a $20 million loss the day the loan is made. Because you've already got 100% loan to value ratio on the first loan. A little history. Of course, the San Francisco OTS, or I guess back then, the bank board, um, had jurisdiction over that shop and we had recommended that it be put into receivership and DC's response was we're taking your jurisdiction away and we're going to set up a blue ribbon panel of examiners to take a look at Lincoln Savings and make sure what you're telling us is really correct. Um, they put in some folks that, well, in my opinion, weren't the most talented people in the world and after about four or five weeks, you know, they were saying they really hadn't found any losses. Um, a friend of mine and former examiner in the California Department of Savings and Loan, the California regulator, a guy named Richard Newsom, went down there at, at about week six to start the CDSL exam. The first file he asked for was the Pontchartrain file because it was a big, big loan. He sees a $20 million loan, sees it's a $20 million loss right off the bat, calls management on it, asks the federal people what the hell they're doing. They don't have an explanation. Um, I end up going down there after the receivership and looked at a bunch of transactions in this area called Hidden Valley. And what Lincoln was doing here was they had made direct investments in land. Remember, after the interest rate crisis of the SNLs, the answer was deregulate, let them diversify into other types of loans and direct investments. Under the theory of diversification, we'll let them make more money. And so they buy all this land. 30 miles outside of Phoenix, with just barren desert between Phoenix and this 30-mile development. And I'm looking at the transactions, and they had sold the land to a bunch of developers, and at prices that were 50, 60, 70, 100% higher than what Lincoln had purchased the land for itself. So of course, huge gain on sale, right? Big, big dollars running through the income statement. Now Gap 
requires, for you to book a game, requires the borrower to have a certain down payment on the property to make sure that the risk has really been transferred, right? If I own a piece of property that I bought for $10 and I sell it for $20, but I give the buyer $20 to buy it, I shouldn't be able to book that $10 gain. I mean, I'm really financing the whole thing. So you want to make sure the borrower has that down payment in there. So we asked, and you look at the file for the one sale, and you go, okay, yeah, 20% down payment meets FAS 66, FAS 67, that's good. And then you go, well, but where'd that down payment come from? And so you do a little more looking, and you found out that a, another subsidiary of American Continental Corp., which was the parent of Lincoln, made the down payment loan. So it really was 100% financing. This was to the tune of over $100 million, I believe, that resulted in like $30 million of gains, a good chunk of which flows into the income statement, a good chunk of which flows into their salaries and bonuses. Same old story every time. It was different now when we got to the issues that caused the financial crisis, right? Because now it's not a bunch of big loans. It's a horde of loans on homes. And I think one of the reasons I've always thought that the regulators sort of missed this, or at least didn't care about it, <laughs> was you had the countrywides of the world, the WAMUs of the world, et cetera, making all these loans. And it's right, everybody knew underwriting standards had gone down and that the loans weren't the usual 20% down payment, you know, 80% loan to value ratio. Uh, DTI ratios of 28 and 36%, so you had a good idea that the borrower could pay, and even if the borrower didn't pay, you had enough cushion on the value so that you could sell the property and avoid loss. And when you go into a bank and you want to make sure that their financials are right as a bank examiner or an auditor or whoever, um, you're going to look at the loan files, right? But here, the lenders weren't keeping the loans, right? So if I'm a, a regulator with the OCC, the OTS, the FDIC, any state, et cetera, and I go in and I say, boy, you know, they're making a bunch of loans with high LTVs and high DTIs, et cetera. But you know what? They're not on the books. So I don't have to worry about the bank because they're being sold, right? Now, who did they first get sold to, as Bill was saying? They get sold to the investment banks, right? Now, they weren't regulated too well either. You know, they were pretty much subject to the SEC and, I guess, FINRA. And they would go in. Let's assume that they went in and did a good job. We know they didn't, but let's assume they did. But even they would have said, well, they're securitizing them, and they're blowing them out to investors, and the credit rating agencies have rated most of it AAA. So even if they're lousy loans, it's not going to bite the investment bank in the ass. It's not going to bite the lender in the first place in the ass. Obviously, they sort of forgot about the reps and warranties. <laughs> and uh, that's where there's a lot of litigation now. Bill mentioned the FHFA lawsuits. There's a law firm called Quinn Emanuel that's running all of those FHFA suits and has filed a bunch of other private actions on behalf of folks that have taken huge losses. And if you look at all their complaints, they're all pretty much the same. And what they allege in these complaints is that, of course, their client bought the securities. They relied on the reps and warranties. And there were key reps and warranties that are really the subject of these actions. One is that they, they follow, that the loans they purchased met the underwriting criteria of the lender or the investment bank, or, and this is the key word, had compensating factors if they didn't. And then they made various reps and warranties about the overall loan-to-value ratios of the loans backing the securities, about the debt-to-income ratios, how many properties were owner-occupied, the geographic location of the properties, etc. And when you look at these complaints now, there's basically four things they allege to overcome the presumption and, and let their case go forward that there was, in fact, misconduct by the securitizers. First, they just say, look what's happened, right? And the default rates on these securitizations are 40%. I mean, that, in the lawsuit side, like that, they're very high, right? And as I'll get to in a minute, for private securities litigation, just a big, huge drop like that itself is indicative of misconduct and knowledge that the loans didn't meet the criteria. The second thing they point to is some information that came out um, both from the FCIC and from Levin's PSI investigation. And that was, despite this representation that if loans didn't meet underwriting criteria, they were excluded or they were included if they had compensating factors. In fact, the due diligence firms like Clayton and others were finding that a good chunk of the loans did not meet the underwriting criteria, but they were waived in anyway 
even though they did not have compensating factors. So that's the direct lie in the prospectus. And then the other things are the specific numbers. And what Quinn Emanuel's done is, is, is pretty interesting. On the loan-to-value ratios, what they've done is they've somehow figured out the location of a bunch of the properties. And they've gone through to use uh, a, a valuation technique to see what was the value of the property on the day the loan was made. <coughs> and then they've just collated it together. They've done it on a sample basis. They've done like a thousand loans for uh, the FHFA actions. And they found out that they were, the loan-to-value ratios were much higher than what was represented in the prospectus. Um, and then the other area they've gone on is the owner occupancy. And a lot of this is because they don't have access to the actual loan files. They have to do this through public information. And an owner occupancy, what they did was for those loans, they said, okay, well, let's see where the tax bills are being sent. Let's see where, you know, if just through public records, see if these borrowers own multiple properties. And if, if, and there were other factors too. And if they found, for example, that the tax bill was not sent to the address of the home, but sent to another address, that's an indicator that this really wasn't an owner-occupied home. It was an investment property, a spec property, or whatever. And so those cases all got filed not that long ago. They're in the, the briefing phase of the motion to dismiss. We'll see if these complaints get upheld. So. Your computer wants to sleep. Too long on one side. Right. <laughs> now, what I do now is I do private securities fraud class actions, which are essentially the stock drop suits. And the main statute in here is Section 10 of the Securities and Exchange Act, which was passed in 1934 in the wake of the Depression. Now, to read all that, it basically says, don't lie. <laughs> this is Rule 10b-5, the implementing regulation that says, don't lie. Um, and the key section is really B, which is the don't lie section, whereas A and C are don't scam even if you don't speak. These are the key elements of a 10b-5 claim. And what I've put in parens are some, some fairly recent, some this year, Supreme Court cases that I'm not too, too particularly thrilled with since they make my job hard. Um, obviously somebody has to make a false statement, right? The easiest false statement to prove is when a company's financial statements get restated. Right? We said our earnings were X. A year down the road, they say, oops, not really. They were really one-half X. You're done on falsity. You're done on materiality because you only restate if it's a material amount. Um, the Janus case is a case that just came out earlier this year where um, Justice Thomas basically limited who you can get on a false statement in the key languages. You have to, the speaker has to have ultimate authority to speak. So essentially when companies, every quarter they have an earnings conference call. And they issue a press release, so here's their earnings, they have a conference call, the analysts attend, it's usually the CEO and the CFO. Those are pretty much the people I sue now. Um, SEC filings, if you sign them, you're considered a maker of the statement. Usually the CEO and the CFO file the quarterly cues. Um, CEO, the CFO, and the whole board signs the case. So you can get them. And also, importantly, in the annual 10K, there will be audited financials um, certified as complying with general accepted accounting principles by the auditors. So the auditors make a statement on the annual, on the annual financial statements. The, the statement has to be material. Um, there was a case, this is a good one for us actually, Matrix, which was a drug case where the defendants were arguing, you know, unless the adverse results from a drug study were statistically significant, it, it has to be that or it's not material, and the court said, no, 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 that's nuts. Um, so that was a good one for us. In 10B cases, again, these are stock drops, so it has to be in connection with the purchase or sale of a security. The Morrison case was where Australian plaintiffs bought stock of an Australian bank on the Australian Stock Exchange. No 10B cause of action. But this was the first case that said that. This was a Scalia. Scalia wrote this opinion, although I think it was, it was not the usual 5-4 opinion. I think they all agreed. There used to be something called the Conducts and Effects Test. I won't go into it. Needless to say now, um, it's usually not a problem in any of our cases. The key area is Cianter that we'll get to in some future slides. Tell Labs is a case in 2007 that discusses not what constitutes Cianter. There's earlier cases on that. Either you know your statement is false or you're deliberately reckless or reckless in making the statement. And we'll get to that in a little while. 
reliance. There's two kinds of reliance known as transaction causation and loss causation. And we'll get to loss causation in a minute. And older cases, you know, there was a presumption of reliance if it was an omission case. If you failed to disclose something of which there was a duty to disclose, you automatically presume reliance. And the other on the fraud on the market presumption is that, I mean, think about it. When you buy stock, are you really relying, you know, pouring through all those Qs and Ks and analyst reports and then making my decision to buy the stock? No. But in an efficient market, all of the company's statements about the company are reflected in the stock price. So the reliance element is satisfied by that basis. You're presuming a fraud on the, a fraud on the market presumption of reliance. The, the company's statements true and false are reflected in the stock price. So if companies are making false statements about the company, for example, we earned X instead of one half X, that all other things being equal is going to make the price higher and artificially inflated. You're buying it at too high a price. Loss causation. In this case, this is actually our case and, and a partner of mine argued it in the Supreme Court, and the issue was before, causation in terms of pleading was a very simple one sentence. All we would plead is plaintiff purchased a stock at an artificially inflated price. And defendants argued, and they were right, um, look, that's not good enough. I mean, if you sell it the next day at the same inflated price, you don't have any loss, so there's no causation. And the Supreme Court agreed with that. And so now, not only do you plead that you bought it at an artificially inflated price, but you got to plead that you still held the stock when the artificial inflation came out, when the truth about the company's condition started to be revealed. So what do you do? Um, in the best of all worlds, you know, when I'm trying to investigate cases and, and, and produce a complaint that's going to survive a motion to dismiss, I would love to be able to just take discovery, right, and get all the files from the company and what was going on. But as I'm going to talk about in a minute, can't do that in private securities litigation. In 1995, they passed a law called the Private Securities Litigation and Reform Act that said a stay of discovery. You file your complaint. If it's good enough to meet the heightened pleading standards of the PSLRA and you survive a motion to dismiss, then you get to take discovery, but not before. And that was part of the contract of America back in 95 when folks thought plaintiff's lawyers, not that they don't think that now, were just a bunch of greedy plaintiff's lawyers causing corporate America a big hassle. To me, it's not coincidental that after that, that law was passed, that several years later you had huge corporate frauds like Enron and WorldCom, et cetera. But other things you can do, you can make FOIA requests. And I'm going to cover a couple times where I've done that and been successful. But essentially, this is what you do. A case gets filed and it gets assigned to me, right? And I've got to file a consolidated complaint in usually like 60 days. I pull all the press releases, conference calls, <coughs> analyst reports, SEC filings, etc. I have all those things just put in chronological order and I'm going to read them and see what story unfolds. In addition to that, I'm going to have two things next to me that are very, very important. I'm going to have my financial trend analysis because I want to see of the balance sheet and the income statement. I want to see what that company's reported over time, see if we're going to see the leverage growth, see where the money is being made, see what's generating the income, see the salaries, etc. The daily stock prices and percentage changes is the other document that you're going to have in front of you. And actually, what I get is I have San Diego, where our mothership is, um, the guys in the, the, the economic section of our firm, put together <coughs> for me the daily, the date, the price, the percentage change for the company. Every company is required and discloses either in their proxy statement or their 10K how their price, <coughs> the stock of their price, has, comp has performed compared to usually two indexes, so investors can, yes sir? Um, on private security, so aren't you daily stock prices, isn't that going to be non-existent? No. Huh? Well, private securities? Pri private meaning not government actions. Obviously, yes, in my practice, public companies, companies with publicly traded stock. The private securities litigation reform act and private securities litigation means by the private plaintiff's bar, not by the SEC, not by the DOJ. That's what that means. So not only of the company, but of the peer group, and usually it's you know the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 if they're on that exchange, and usually another index, which is a group of companies in their industry. And it's important because you have to look at how their stock price changed versus the index. And I'll get into that in a minute. Other proceedings are government investigations. If, for example, other proceedings like a bankruptcy proceeding, 
I've had a couple cases where the company that I'm suing has gone bankrupt. So I've got the officers as defendants, but the company's bankrupt. Get on that bankruptcy docket and you'll find documents in there that the company has filed. Several times I've found stuff in there that's been great for my case. Um, there's various motives to look at. You're going to look at insider selling. Is the company buying company? Is the company that you're suing acquiring other companies? Are they raising funds? And of course, the almighty one, what's their executive compensation structure? And then terminations. Has anybody get fired when the bad news came out, even though they'll terminate a resignation? And then a big part of it is former employees. There's a discovery stay, but what we usually do is hire investigators to beat the bushes and find former employees and say, what the hell was going on within the company? Now, as I said, we can't take discovery, right? In 1995, when they passed the act, you cannot take discovery until you survive a motion to dismiss. That's just what the statute says. That's the site. The purpose is to prevent unnecessary imposition of discovery costs on defendants and to assure, and to assure that you know, we have a legitimate complaint here. Um, again, that's, I practice in Northern District of California and the Ninth Circuit, so you're going to see, if you don't see Supreme Court authority, you're going to pretty much see Ninth Circuit authority from me. It's not absolute. You can lift the stay if your request is particularized, not just saying, give me everything you know about the company, and if maintenance of the stay would generate an impermissible risk of evidence destruction or create undue prejudice. And I believe in the Wachovia case, they actually ended up getting documents. What's undue pre Well, first, particularized request, like I said, it's not just a fishing expedition, give me everything. A clearly defined universe of documents that you want to get. In a restatement case, you know, when if a company announces a restatement, they're going to say, look, we're writing down, um, we improperly recognized revenue because it was percentage of completion and we mismeasured it. So you're going to do a particularized request, says, give me everything on the documents about how you determine what revenue to recognize in these time periods that were restated on this area. That's not a difficult thing to, to come up with for a particularized request. What it really comes down to is undue prejudice. And again, undue prejudice exists under the case law. There's an improper unfair treatment amounting to something less than irreparable harm. And what you're trying to do is balance the competing concerns of maintaining truth and integrity in the marketplace while curbing meritless litigation. Usually, if I ever have a case where there is a government investigation, by the SEC usually, of course, an investigation where the company always discloses in their SEC filing, yes, we're being investigated, yes, we're fully cooperating, and yes, we've given them documents, right? So I will make a motion in the federal district court that I'm in saying, look, here's my particularized request. They've already given the documents to the SEC. Make them give them to me. And this is just a blurb out of the In Red Bank of America case, which is the case that surrounds the Merrill Lynch acquisition and the failure to disclose the bonuses and the losses and all of that, where Judge Chin in the Southern District of New York said it's yours. Then it was my case. <laughs> um, in In Red Verifone by... Uh, being heard by Judge Patel in the Northern District of California, where again, they came out in December of 2007, so you can see, four years later, I'm still trying to get this case upheld on a motion to dismiss, but it was a huge restatement, um, three quarters in 2007, and they disclosed that the SEC was investigating them and that they'd given them documents, and so we said, well, look, they've given the SEC the documents, give them to us. The court said no, and the court basically drew this, this distinction that, uh, well, in some of those other cases, they've only given the documents where it looked like, you know, the company was going to die and the documents would be gone. You know, Verifone's not going to die. They're not going to be gone. Yeah, it's not going to be burdensome for them to produce it. Yeah, you gave me a particularized request, but no. Um, so we lost that one. So we went to the Freedom of Information Act, and we sent the SEC a FOIA request and saying, we want the documents related to your investigation of Verifone. The SEC, being the wonderful agency it is, said no. Again and again and again, we appealed, we appealed, we appealed, and we finally got it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me, the very first thing I think you have to do in private securities litigation is you have to get these daily stock prices. And again, we talked about Dura Pharmaceuticals and, and how 
the Ninth Circuit was wrong to hold that just pleading an inflated stock price alone was sufficient, and instead you have to plead that the price fell. So like I say, it's one of the first investigative tasks you have to complete because what you do is you get this spreadsheet, right? And you've got the daily prices. And anytime you see a big percentage increase or decrease, that alerts you to find out what happened that day. If you see a big increase, there's probably a good chance the company said something positive, right? Hey, we just got signed a great new deal. Hey, we just reported earnings that beat the street. Um, and that, that is good. More importantly, yes, sir? How do you account for somebody just as shorting it down? How do you, I mean, that could happen. It? That could happen. But that in itself doesn't necessarily, if you see somebody taking a big short position in a company, yeah. I as an investigator, I think I might call that person <laughs> and say, yeah. why are you shorting them? What do, what do you think yeah. you have? But the other thing you're going to look at is you're going to look, that's why you look not just at the company change in price, you look at it in comparison to the peer and the index. Because you want to try to ferret out if the whole stock market tanks by three or four percent in a day and your company stock went down four percent that day that doesn't help you they're just going to come back and say no that's just the whole market going down that's nothing company specific um, and that's why you have to look at things like that but the point is even an admitted false statement you're not going to have a claim if it didn't cause loss i mean somebody can come on and say yeah i lied about that but when we reveal the truth nothing happened in the stock price so you have no claim and they're right, so you have to be able to show causation. So here's my Verifone. I mean, obviously I had a multi-page document with various dates on it, but these are the dates of the stock drops, right? So December 3rd, 2007 is the first date they come out and they say, well, we're not going to be able to report um, four Q07 results when we usually do in January, and by the way, we're going to have to restate. You see a 46% decline in their stock price while the S&P 500 went down 0.6% and there was no change in the peer group. Obviously, <laughs> that was something company specific that drove down the stock price. Um, and then, if you want to try to figure out what news actually caused that to go down, you know, you can look at the analysts that follow the company and what they're reporting on is important. Now, this one was easy. I mean, the only bad news was the restatement. I will tell you, though, with the way another part of loss causation law that can be problematic is there could be multiple reasons it causes the stock price to decline. And defendants will argue, well, well, wait a minute. Yeah, we announced a restatement. We also we were lowering our guidance. We also announced that you know, there was an investigation unrelated to the restatement. And we announced you know, five different pieces of unrelated bad news, right? And so you have to show that it's your bad news that you're suing on that's related to the false statement that caused the loss. And candidly, if I'm a, an executive and I know I've got to release some bad news that may get me in trouble, I'm going to combine it with a bunch of other stuff just to try to make the argument down the road that I can't be held accountable. These other dates, um, I think on January 2nd it was there's going to be a further delay in figuring out the restated amount. March 6th they, 6th, they canceled an appearance at an investor conference. The analyst then said, oh, there must be more trouble in figuring out the restatement. And then on April 2nd they came out with what they said were the final restated numbers and announced the CFO had resigned. Um, <laughs> you, will analysts readily talk to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will not. Uh, in fact, I don't even try to call them very much. I mean, and you have their reports. I mean, so that's, and, but you know, once you get into discovery and we depose them, nobody likes to get a deposition subpoena. Um, I have this is a case that will be filed on December 2nd. Um, and again, Cisco, the, the stock drops, as you can see, were in November of last year and February and March, or excuse me, May of this year. And again, just looking at the percentage change in stock price declines versus the S&P 500 and the S&P Infotech Index. Again, these are what Cisco compares itself to. If you want, I'll describe to you what's going on in that case that will be for the world to see on December 2nd when I file the complaint. The key battleground in most of these cases is Center is the state of mind. Usually it's easy to say, here's who made the statement, here's why it's false, and it caused loss through that analysis we were just doing. Um, the big issue is proving that the defendants either knew they were lying or were deliberately reckless in not knowing that they were lying. So again, remember, as you guys probably, at least law students in here and lawyers know from Civ Pro and probably corporations, Federal Rule Civil Procedure 9B for fraud cases says you've got to be particular on the facts showing why there, there was a false statement or fraud, 
but you can still allege the state of mind or scienter generally. This is another part of the PSLRA in 1995 that heightened the pleading standard and said, no, now you have to be particularized on why the defendants um, knew or were reckless in not knowing that their statements were false. So now it's particularized not just on the facts constituting the fraud, but on defendants' knowledge of it. No discovery, heightened pleading standard. At a time when fraud is off the charts. I don't get it. So the Tell Labs case is important in understanding how the court's going to look at your complaint. And there's, there's two main points. One, it's a comparative evaluation. And so you've got all these facts that you're going to plead in your complaint. We're going get to get to that in a minute. And the court can't just say, all right, I'm looking at all those facts, and yeah, I could see, I could infer from that that the defendants knew that they were reporting false financial results or making false statements about the business. But I can also see that they weren't. You know, it depends on, it's all about inference drawing, right? And the key here was saying, well, I, this was an appeal, I think, from the Seventh Circuit case where the Seventh Circuit had said the, the inference of fraud has to be greater than an inf a non-culpable inference. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 ties go to the plaintiff. You know, but it's got to be, to qualify as strong, it's got to be more than plausible or reasonable. It's got to be cogent and at least as compelling as any opposing inference of non-fraudulent intent. What we say in hearings and stuff, ties go to the plaintiff. If you look at these facts and you say it's just as plausible that they committed fraud that they didn't, we win. Remember, you view the facts in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, which is the plaintiff on a motion to dismiss. It's also a collective analysis. You look at all of the facts together. You don't scrutinize each individual allegation of Sienter in isolation. This, I think, has actually been a big problem because what you see a lot of courts do is you know, you'll be pleading things like, well, there was a restatement, there was a bunch of gap violations, the CFO got fired, the analysts were angry when they heard about it, um, witnesses that former employees of the company say that there was all kinds of problems in internal controls. If the CEO and the CFO sold a bunch of stock you know, during this time period, if take all these facts together, you know, the, in, the, the most cogent, compelling, and reasonable inference is that they knew that they were lying. What a lot of courts do is they look at each one individual. They do the, quote, dual inquiry. They'll say, that one, eh, not good enough. That one, eh, not good enough. That one, eh, not good enough. That one's okay. You know, but that one's not good enough. And then they say, at the end of the opinion, and now I'll consider it all collectively and holistically, still not good enough. Get out of my courtroom. And in fact, Verifone is a case where I'm going to describe to you why I'm incensed at where I am in this case right now. So as I said, on December 3rd, 2007, they announced that they're restating their, their first, second, third quarter financial results, and it was a huge restatement. What happened was, they had just purchased a company called Litman, and it is, by the way, Verifone makes the little point of sale terminals when you go into the store and you swipe your card. That's Verifone, that's what they make. They had purchased an Israeli company called Litman, and these were the first three quarters after the merger was completed. What had happened was these internal reports came in that said, oh, well, your gross margins are in the low 40s when they had guided to the street that they would be in the high 40s. And what they did was they just did manual journal entries to gain the numbers. And the defendants argued, yeah, that happened. There's no dispute about this. You know, Improper manual accounting entries were made to change the numbers three quarters in a row. Um, and cause them to misreport the financial statements. The SEC, in September of 2009, a year plus later, or almost two years later, um, sued Verifo and Paul Periolet was the guy that made the manual journal entries. Didn't sue the CEO or the CFO, just sued the guy that made the manual journal entries, and you'll, that's an important point when I get to the further facts. Made Periolet pay a $25,000 fine, and and Verifone and Perlet promised not to do it again. No admission or denial of, of wrongdoing. In my opinion, anyway, the allegations in the SEC complaint itself, and the SEC complaint probably like 10 pages, you know, they don't have to be these big particularized things like we file on the plaintiff's bar. Uh, to me, it's bizarre that the CEO and the CFO weren't charged at all, um, and they should have been charged for fraud. 
So as I said earlier, we got these transcripts of SEC depositions. Bergeron was the CEO, is the CEO, still of, of Verifone. Zwornstein is the former CFO. Merkel's not a party at all, but she was the controller that reported to CFO Zwornstein. Um, Judge Patel denied our, our motion for relief from the discovery stay, but we got the transcripts from the SEC after about a year of writing letters and, and threatening a motion, and they finally gave it to us. So they buy Littman. Before, if you looked at the financial trend analysis of Littman before the acquisition, you see their gross margins lower than Verifone's and declining in the years leading up to the acquisition. Yet Verifone's guidance was margins are going to go up. Analysts themselves, before as the acquisition was closing, was saying, I hope the margins go up, but boy, looks the math seems to indicate they would go down. But fine. So that's one fact. Uh, this, this is information from the transcripts, by the way, that I wouldn't have known, you know, absent these transcripts. I wouldn't have known it from the public documents. I wouldn't have known it from the SEC complaint. They were concerned about the gross margin forecast in the high 40s, even before they got these reports, you know, shortly after the end of the first quarter of 2007, because Littman's margins were declining, because they were having trouble getting information from Littman, and because the information they did get from them in putting in the forecast, they questioned whether it was right. I mean, there was, I don't have the emails and the documents referenced in the depot transcripts, but they described them. You know, and, and they're reading the email saying, boy, can these numbers really be right? It doesn't make sense. So going in, they know they have questions about the forecast and whether we're going to meet it. 1Q07 ends, they, don't, they have one of those funky fiscal years. So their first quarter ends, I think, January 2007, yes. <laughs> so they get... Um, what they call flash reports, like the first week of February that shows the gross margins 41% instead of 47%, right? And of course, earnings lower too. It's like, holy, what are we going to do? What's going on here? They tell Periolet to figure out what's wrong. They say in emails, according to these transcripts, if those are the right number, this is an unmitigated disaster and the party would be over big time for us. Periolet can't find an error for a week. He can't find an error. He's looking at all the, the documents. And, according to a depot transcript, he writes in an email, I guess we completely missed the boat on the gross margin forecast. Obviously, Bergeron and Zwarenstein testify, and the documents referenced in the depot transcript indicate they know about all this. They know we can't find it. And they, therefore, now have an even more reason to believe that the gross margin forecast they already had questions about is probably wrong. So you'd figure, all right, we're going to have to come clean and tell the street that we messed up and report lousy results and our stock price will take a beating. That's the way it goes, right? No. Zwarnstein provides Periole with the types of adjustments and the precise dollar amount so that Verifone will report its results in line with guidance. The SEC attorney taking the deposition actually says to Zwarnstein, you know, you would think you just get your reports, see what the numbers are, and report them. It seems if you get those reports and then you tell somebody to make adjustments to get to a predetermined number to meet guidance, that seems like a funny way of accounting. And Zwarnstein's response was, fair enough. <laughs> so, of course, they make the adjustments, right? And these adjustments, as we found out once the restatement is announced, completely unsupported. They were fraudulent. And they were not verified, even though policy at Verifone is we don't make unsupported accounting adjustments. We require support and we verify them. But that didn't happen here. That was just the first quarter, right? In the next two quarters, they again get reports with the margin substantially lower than what the forecast was. They again make the fraudulent adjustments. This time, there's more. The adjustments in 2Q07 cause inventory to increase a small 609%. That would be a little red flag to take a look at. That adjustment could be wrong. In 3Q07, the, the adjustments cause inventory to be higher than any forecasted number that Zwarnstein had ever seen in the forecast. Should we check the adjustments? No. <laughs> During all this time, Bergeron and Zwarnstein sell $100 million of their stock. Zwarnstein sold, it was over 90% of his entire stock holdings. 
Bergeron, since he's the CEO and owns just hordes of stock, it wasn't a huge percentage, but my favorite part of that is, and you know, he's selling in the $40 ranges, right? And he actually made an argument in the motion, he goes, hey, I, I had more stock that I didn't sell than I sold, and I took losses on those, so that negates any Sienta reference against me. What he forgot to point out, that we of course pointed out in our opposition brief, is that he acquired his stock at three cents a share. <laughs> he didn't lose a damn thing. And then, of course, the company announced that Zwornstein had resigned, but Zwornstein testified to the SEC that he resigned because Bergeron and the board told him it would look better to the SEC. So, those are, that's, that's just some of the facts, right? And so again, remember, a collective analysis, drawing inferences, both culpable and non-culpable, ties go to the plaintiffs, right? It's like, with all of that, is it just as plausible that these guys either deliberately cook the books by telling Perry Olay, here's the number of adjustments to make because I need to sell my stock and I need to report numbers that meet the street, or is it, you know, we were really just trying to figure out what was wrong, and yeah, we messed up, but it wasn't fraud. Well, we thought we had a slam dunk case, the judge did not, and the judge granted the motion to dismiss and granted it with prejudice. We are now on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Reply briefs got filed on Halloween. It better be reversed. And it's a huge damage case. The damages are over a billion dollars in this case. Okay, so let's go into some specifics about investigation and how when you're subject to a discovery state, how can you plead a fraud case? Insider selling is something that everybody always thinks about and that the case law is, is, is clear. You don't have to plead motive. I mean, Tell Labs made that clear. There's Ninth Circuit case law that makes that clear. Um, if you just have facts that show knowledge or deliberate recklessness, you're fine. You don't need a motive. But motive can help, obviously. Everybody wants to know why did people do what they do. The rules for insider trading are set forth here. This is a Ninth Circuit case, but I'm pretty sure this is the case in every circuit throughout, throughout the U.S. Insider trading is only suspicious when it's dramatically out of line with tr prior trading practices. Times calculated to maximize personal gain. You look at these three factors, the amount and percentage of shares sold, the timing of the sales, and whether the sales were consistent with insider prior trading history. So again, you know, insiders, and this was a, a reform after Enron, it used to be, I think you could wait till, like, till the end of the year, you know, to file your forms with the SEC that said when you sold stock. Now you got two days. So there's public information on when insiders sell their stock. It's easy to find. So again, I have my friends in the San Diego mothership work up an insider selling analysis for any case. You know, during the class period, tell me which individuals sold how much stock. I want the date they sold, the amount of shares they sold that date, and the dollar amount. I want it for the class period, and I also want it for, if I have a year class period, I also want it for the year prior to the class period. Remember, one of the elements is it dramatically out of line with prior trading practices. Um, in my Cisco case, John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, sold 515,000 shares for like $11 million in the year plus before the class period I'm going to be pleading. During the class period, he sold, I forget the number of shares, but it was like 10 times the number of shares for $134 million. I, I certainly have met the test on dramatically out of line with, with prior trading practices as we did with um, Zwarenstein in, in the Verifone case. Um, so you want to look, that's one, look at before and, and during class period sales. You want to look at the amount, and the rules generally are look at the percentage of, of the stock they sold, but what the courts also want to see, it's not just the shares they hold, it's also vested options, right? And of course, all you got to do is look at a proxy statement for any public company, and you'll see that a big part of their compensation is options, some of which have vested, some of which have not. So you have to include the vested options in there. Um, when they sold, timing is important. Is it suspicious, suspiciously timed sales? Um, in my Cisco case, right after... Cisco reported their earnings in February 2010. Like two weeks later, Chambers sold about $50 million worth of his stock. And he's, he exercised options that weren't scheduled to expire for several months. Even the analysts pointed out, well, if you're making such these positive statements about your company, why are you exercising options that don't expire yet? Because you would think you think your stock price is going to go up since you're telling us everything's going so great. 
Um, so you want to look at timing and you just want to, you, know, you do what you can, right? I mean, if they're close to the date of the false statement, another good part of timing for insider selling, if they sell a bunch right before the bad news gets announced, you know, close proximity and time to the bad news, helpful. Um, again, remember, part of the rule was to maximize personal benefit, so I like to look at profitability, which can sometimes be difficult, because you can't always tell what they acquire the stock at, and you can't always tell which options they exercise to sell from the information. But in some cases, you can. Like, I just pulled the, the proxy for Verifone and saw that, that Bergeron had acquired all his stock at three cents a share. So basically, 100% of the sale was profit. Now, in terms of, of price, there is a Ninth Circuit case that says, and it's the Ronconi case, where, yeah, defendants sold their stock, but they ended up selling close to the price the stock dropped to when the bad news came out. So that negated Sienter, and I think that's a legitimate rule. Another issue is, were the sales pursuant to a 10B51 trading plan? I suspect probably every senior executive in every public company has one of these because it helps them if something goes wrong. And what they do is they set up a predetermined trading plan that says every month, you know, I'm going to sell 5,000 shares. And look, there are legitimate reasons for company executives to get rid of their stock. You don't want all your eggs in one basket. So you should be getting rid of some of your stock to diversify. Of course, boards of directors want company executives to hold a certain amount of stock, under the theory anyway, that it'll align their interests with shareholders and they'll do their best for the company. Uh, but what the arguments we make on these are, this is really an affirmative defense and has no place in the motion to dismiss. Courts don't buy that argument too well. And the other thing you want to see is, what are the terms of the plan, and did they modify it during the class period? In the Verifone case, Warrenstein actually modified his 10B51 plan during the class period and increased his monthly sales by a factor of four. That tells you something, I think. Executive compensation is another area you're going to look at when you're trying to plead facts that will strengthen the inference of Sienter. And again, there's case law on this from the Ninth Circuit. You want to look to see if there's a strong correlation between the financial results and stock options or cash bonuses for individual defendants. And so again, the proxy statement that public companies file will include the compensation of the top five paid executives of the company. And let's face it, when these companies get sued for securities fraud, Usually it's those top five because the CEO and the CFO are usually in there. They're the ones making the statements. And there will also be usually in there a report or at least a summary report by the compensation committee about what their comp plan is and what impacts, bonuses, raises, options, etc. And so if you can show, which usually you can, you know, that compensation is directly tied to financial results, that's always at least one factor in a comp plan. That can help you. That is another fact to plead in these complaints. And in fact, when I came back from the FCIC, I picked up this Northwest Pipe case, and one of the first things I had to do was write a motion to dismiss opposition in this case. It's a restatement case. Northwest Pipe does, it's a water transmission company. They manufacture the big tubes that you use for, for sewer projects and stuff. And they, and so they're constructing tubes over time, you recognize the revenue over time as you're, as you're manufacturing the tubes, not as you buy the steel. That's what they were doing. They were booking a bunch of revenue upon buying steel instead of as they were manufacturing it into tubes. And um, one of the many facts we pled was the fact that their executive comp was in fact tied to the company's reported financial results that were inflated by that improper revenue recognition. And the judge cited that as one of the facts in his opinion. Um, that was just issued a couple months ago. Executive terminations. It can go both ways, right? I mean, look, you can screw up and not, not be a fraudster and get fired for screwing up. That doesn't necessarily help you, the plaintiff, on, on, on alleging Sienter. But these are the rules, you know, at least under the Ninth Circuit. With the resignations that are uncharacteristic, to typical hiring patterns, then it could be sufficient to, import, to support an inference that the defendant corporation forced them to resign because of its knowledge of the employee's role in the fraudulent representations. And again, the CEO and CFO in the Northwest Pipe case were both CPAs for decades. And for the CEO, the company had actually said during the class period that this guy, you know, since he's not only CEO but a CPA, is particularly important to the company. Then he resigns. 
after the restatement gets announced. You know, that, those facts indicate that someone who was represented as so important to the company because he's a CPA, then is shown the door, or I guess he resigned. You know, after the restatement is announced, that that all of the things being equal, I think you know goes to the plaintiff side. Is is that something that helps bolster your inference of Sienter? And you also want to look at what they say, right? I mean, obviously you want to look at timing, and of course the timing is usually after the bad news comes out or shortly thereafter, and the reasons, um, both by what the company says, what the individual says, what analysts say, um, what you see in the news reports, right? I have a case against Yahoo that I'm going to be filing on December 16th. Carol Bartz was their CEO until recently. Let me give you a few minutes on, on this case. Yahoo, the, this case generally is about their investment in a company called the um, Alibaba Group, which is their way to participate in the Chinese market. The Alibaba Group owned three companies, Alibaba.com, a company called Taobao, and a company called Alipay. Taobao is essentially the Chinese eBay, Alipay is PayPal. What happened was, back in August of last year, the owner of the Alibaba Group transferred Alipay to a company he owned. Right. So a big, huge portion of Yahoo, and oh, by the way, Yahoo always talked about this investment as a big portion of their value. Analysts, including um, who's the big hedge fund guy um, from New York that almost bought the Mets, I can't remember. David Einhorn. Da David Einhorn, right, made a big investment in Yahoo and said, you know, I think that their investment in uh, Alibaba could frankly be worth their whole market cap. You know, it was accepted and undisputed that the Yahoo's investment in Alibaba was a huge part of their value. Then it gets transferred out in August. It doesn't get disclosed until May 15th of this year in a 10Q no less, not even in a press release or a conference call. And shortly thereafter, Bartz gets canned, right? Although I think officially she resigned. But then, bless her heart, she goes and gives an interview to, to Fortune magazine and says, she was fired over the phone by the chairman of the board, Ray Bostic, that she asked Bostic why he didn't have the balls to fire her in person, and that basically the board, well, you can see what she said. Um, salty language indeed. Um, but that is a fact that is going to help me in pleading this complaint, because you also have the analyst saying, we believe that this firing has something to do with the Alipay transfer. Now, if anyone who's followed Yahoo knows They've had problems for a while. I mean, ever since they turned down the Microsoft bid several years ago, I think it was like a $35 a share. And now they're, I think in the teens, they're certainly sub-20. Um, but this helps. I mean, the, the better help in this case is that when Yahoo announces in their first quarter 10Q filed May 15th of this year, they say, oh, and it's been transferred, right? It's just buried on like page 11 of a Q. Now, usually there'll be an 8K press release or a conference call or something. Well, God bless the analysts. They picked up on it, and the stock dropped a lot the next day, like almost 10%. And the next day, then Yahoo issues a press release the following day and says, oh, well, actually, let me give you a little more information. It was transferred in August of last year, but we didn't find out until March 31st. They announced their first quarter earnings on April 16th. If you knew on March, so they've admitted they knew on March 31st. They've admitted it was a material event that needed to be disclosed by putting it in their 10Q. Why didn't they disclose it during the earnings call? When, by the way, they also talked about Alibaba in general. I don't see, well, I'm in the Northern District, so we'll see. But that in itself, that admission that they knew on March 31st should keep them, should result in motion denied. Um, when we go through the motion to dismiss briefing, at least for the April 16 statements. But, remember they said the transfer occurred in August, and they said they didn't know till March 31st. Well, Jack Ma, who's the head of the Alibaba group, and by the way, Jerry Yang, the founder and chief Yahoo, that's actually his position in the proxy statement, chief Yahoo. Um, <laughs> but he's also a member of the board and used to be the CEO of the company before Barts. He's on the board of Alibaba. <laughs> so, so Jack Ma is the CEO and also board member of Alibaba. He causes Alibaba to issue press release and says, what are you talking about you didn't know? You knew. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say it that directly, but he says, you know, we've had board meetings about this left and right. It's always been understood that 
you know, you've got to have a Chinese national company in China own these kind of companies, otherwise you can't get the license from the People's Bank of China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other facts that you'll see on December 16th, if you're so interested, um, that indicate, or I would say raise a strong, cogent, and compelling inference that they, in fact, knew back in August that this transfer occurred. So I will be bringing the class period back to when they announce their third, second quarter earnings, or whatever the first earnings announcement is after August. It probably would have been in October for their third quarter earnings. So my class period now will start in October instead of April. Restatements and gap violations. Bill talked a little bit about how, you know, if you violate gap, you're committing a felony under the federal securities laws, and he's right, but it's not that simple. You can make a mistake and violate gap, and that doesn't in itself mean fraud. People screw up and that doesn't always mean it's fraudulent. So yes, alleging a misapplication of, of GAAP, you know, standing alone is insufficient. But if you have a drastic overstatement of earnings, revenues, et cetera, capital, um, they can be, it can raise a strong inference of Center, and you want to look at the magnitude and the totality of the accounting violations, and that can get you there. And this is actually a recent case from the Ninth Circuit in 2011 that we emphasized a lot in the, uh, in the Verifone brief because, again, in our Verifone case, like, look, either they just told them to cook the books. I mean, hell, they gave them the amount of adjustments and the types of adjustments. But even if you believe that they thought that that, that wasn't deliberate fraud, the fact that they didn't go and verify the adjustments, they were clearly reckless in, in not doing that. So if you, when you describe significant gap violations with particularity, they may provide powerful and direct evidence to the answer. We all, of course, plaintiff's lawyers love this, this phrase. After all, books do not cook themselves. Judge White in the Northern District um, in the McKesson HBOC case from all, like, over 10 years ago. There we go. Other points when you see that. If you can, and you can usually do this, if you can show that absent the accounting improprieties, the company wouldn't have met guidance, that's a good fact. Um, another good fact that I don't have up here that I pled in one of my cases, when I went through the company's um, loan agreements with, with, with their folks that they borrowed money from, there's covenants in there. You've know, you got to maintain certain debt-to-income ratios, certain liquidity ratios, et cetera. And I was able to show that if they had reported the accurate results as shown in the restatement, they would have violated those debt covenants. Another good fact to plead. Um, if you're violating complicated accounting rules, doesn't help you on Cianter. This Zuko Partners case is, is a Ninth Circuit opinion where the court affirmed the uh, granting of the motion to dismiss, and in there it was a small restatement, $2.6 million, I think. Yeah, that's small. Um, but it had to do with um, software development costs and whether they should be capitalized or not. And the court was right that that's a complicated thing. You know, unlike Verifone, where it's, ooh, the numbers aren't good, make some accounting entries to make the numbers look better. Um, unlike Northwest Pipe, where, hey, let's recognize the revenue as soon as we buy the steel instead of as we manufacture it into pipes. So you want to look at the nature of the accounting violations, the number of gap violations, the length of the restatement or the improper accounting violations, and the amount by which the financial results were, were misstated. And that's why, as I said in the beginning, one of the things I always have with me, whether it's a restatement case or not, is that financial trend analysis. And you want, for, particularly for restatement cases, get the side-by-side -side trend analysis that gives you the quarter as originally reported and the quarter as restated, and even a third column for percent change. Because you want to, you know, plead, look, this was not a small little mistake. It was a big, big change in either reported revenues or earnings. Another motive and thing to plead is that they were raising financing. There's case law that says, you know, look, if while they're making false statements and the stock is inflated, they're using their inflated stock to acquire companies or to raise financing, that's helpful. And again, these are the case law that, that helps that. So, you know, you want to determine if the company issued stock or debt during the class period, and of course, if they did, you may also have a Section 11 claim, which is nice because you don't need Sienta in a Section 11 claim. It's strict liability. Um, and as I said, acquisitions, there's case law in this that says if you're using inflated stock to buy companies, that's also a fact that can help complete Sienter and shows motive. Former employees, a big part of, of the practice. Again, we can't take discovery, so we can't have the company give us documents, we can't take depositions, we can't send interrogatories, we can't send requests for admission, we can't take 30B6 depositions, right? None of that. 
So we hire investigators to find former employees that hopefully knew what was going on in the company. Um, I have an investigator doing that now on the my Cisco case. I have an investigator doing that in pretty much all of my cases. And, you know, obviously you need to plead enough information to show the information attributed to these former employees is reliable and credible. And there's Ninth Circuit case law that says when you do that, you know, tell me what their position was, when they worked there, who they reported to, what their job responsibilities were, etc. Um, and that's sort of the foundation, right? And then, of course, the important stuff is what did they tell you, you know, and does it help you in your case? And again, remember, this is a collective analysis. I mean, obviously, I can't talk about a bunch of stuff all at one time. You've got to talk about each subject. But, you know, listing the various facts that raise a strong inference of scienter, you have to do one, 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 one. But the analysis is a collective analysis, not an isolation. So you're looking at this all together. So, you know, if you have, you know, one witness, like, I will plead a witness that says nothing other than, you know, look, we had a very good reporting process at the company. There were internal reports on this, internal reports on this, internal reports on this. Even if they don't, can't tell me anything about, oh, yeah, and that internal report showed that we knew that was wrong. If I have another witness, or if I have a restatement, or if I have terminations, or other information that considered with that, you know, collectively shows, okay, so we know they misstated their financial statements. We know that from their restatement. We know the CFO got canned, even though they called it a resignation. We know they had a really good internal report system that provided information. You know, we know that there was, the restatement covered a long period of time. We know it was simple accounting. We know there was a lot of gap violations. All of that together, what's the most cogent, compelling, plausible inference? Is it, oops, non-culpable, we made a mistake? Or is it, wink, wink, nod, nod, we're cooking the books on purpose, or we're cooking them through recklessness? And for certain types of things, you know, like in a restatement case, if we'll plead witnesses that were not in the, the CFO's line of reporting or the controller, they'll say, you know, how does a non-accountant type person know anything about this? And, you know, there is, it, it's all contextual, right? It depends on the circumstances. And in this, this Burson case, my recollection is that the facts were that the company lost three orders, you know, from a big customer that represented like 50% of the company's revenues, right? And the company said, well, you know, any idiot in the company, you know, would know that was a big deal and would know about that because it's such a big deal to the company. So you can, again, you've got to be contextual, and obviously, in the best of all worlds, you know, you find the direct report to the CFO that says, oh, yeah, we knew he was cooking the books, and we told him, and he wouldn't stop, you know, but it's a rare case where you get that. So, you know, when you're going and hiring investigators to talk to former employees, it's really important to know your case, and that's why, as I said, get all the documents, put them in chronological order, go through them, go through them again, Go through them again and again and again and understand what the company is about and what the issues are. Have that financial trend analysis, have that stock price analysis. In particular, what, what bad news caused the stock price to go down, those are the areas you need to focus on. So you talk to your investigator, you bombard them with emails saying, here's what I want you to ask about. And then when you get the witness memos, you read them. And in very, I've never gotten a witness memo where I've said, oh, that's perfect. I don't need to call the investigator and go back and talk to him. Um, and then sometimes I will even participate in the interview. And sometimes, as we'll get to the next slide, I will then, before I file the complaint, call that witness and say, look, I'm not naming you, I'm calling you CW2, um, but here's the allegations I'm attributing to you. I want to make sure you're comfortable with this. And you need to be careful. Because sometimes, and this is what happened in this case, which sadly is actually from my firm, where the complaint in a case against Boeing was upheld, and a big reason it was upheld was some information attributed to a confidential witness. After the case was upheld, the defendant's defense counsel talk, you know, found out who this witness was. And by the way, defense counsel always says in discovery, we want you to disclose the identi identity of your confidential witnesses. We never will, absent a court order. And, and, on the, and, and the point is, is that they know who it is. I mean, usually the description of the complaint are good enough for that everybody knows who the witness is. In fact, I tell that to defense counsel. I go, tell me right now you don't know who CW1 is. You know, well, that's not the point. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, he turned, you know, and he told defense counsel when they showed him the complaint, he said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody that, you know. And the, the court, you know, wrote an opinion 
and said, you know, even though I found the case was good enough, and even though in discovery, in the time of the discovery, documents had been found that further confirmed and strengthened the allegations in the complaint, she dismissed it. And, she, and the case is gone. It's now, on, we are appealing that. It's not my case, so I don't know the specifics of it, but we are on appeal on that. But the main point is you have to be careful and you have to be diligent on reading witness memos, talking to witnesses, and making sure you plead it accurately because, you know, fraud suits are a big deal. I mean, you are accusing people of, of misconduct and you have to have a basis for, for the suit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just about done, actually. Yeah, so the last points are sort of related to accounting. In the wake of Enron, you know, they passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 that makes CEOs and CFOs certify the accuracy of the financial statements reported and that they have an adequate and effective system of internal controls and that they designed it, maintained it, tested it, etc. We always plead, you know, if there's a restatement, obviously those certifications were false because if so, there wouldn't have been a restatement. And it should be that that in itself, you know, should, in my opinion, obviously unbiased, you know, make you survive a motion to dismiss. But it doesn't. I mean, we plead this as one fact of many in restatement cases, but the case law is pretty clear. A Ninth Circuit's tough. You know, a, a SOC certification alone, you know, is not good enough, but they can be, you know, if you have other facts that show that, look, the most plausible inference is that these guys knew they were cooking the books. Um, finally, internal reports, obviously the best way to show somebody knew they were lying is if they got reports saying the opposite. And so if you can have witnesses tell you that, that's very helpful. Um, you need to, when you plead that, you need to include some specifics so the allegations are reliable. If you just say, oh, there were reports saying that the numbers were really this. Not good enough. You know, you gotta, what was the name of the report? Who got them? You know, what kind of information was it? Who prepared them, et cetera. Um, so this third point's obvious. And then there are some things where that are just so obvious that you can say, look, <laughs> you know, the company would have known about this. And this is similar to that Burson case. If you lose half of your orders for the quarter, they're going to know. I've been told to stop, and I think that's it. So thank you very much. I know we're done. If you have questions, feel free to ask me. Thanks.